in light of this antagonistic relationship I had with the world, I had to be tough and I had to be strong and I had to be capable and I had to be ready to fight. What's happening, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 696, with my guest today, Scott Burr. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. What does that mean? Well, go to whistlekick.com. You'll find what it means. It's where you're going to find all the things that we do to support traditional martial arts and traditional martial artists, like our store, where we sell some stuff. We hook you up with some good stuff, some quality equipment, some fun apparel. And in exchange, we get to make things like this show, which actually takes a lot of work and people. <laughs> There's a code that'll get you 15% off. It's podcast15, helps us connect some dots on the back end. But if you want to go deeper on the show, check out whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've brought you with today's episode, 696 episodes, and they're all available for free. You can go back years. We've been doing this thing for a long time. Pretty much every topic you could think of, a lot of the big names in the martial arts world, yeah, we've talked to them. And you can find every single episode in your podcast app or on YouTube or at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We're bringing two shows each and every week. And why? Why do we do this? Knowing your why is important. Well, our why is to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to help the show, the work that we do, if our mission means something to you, there are lots of ways you could help. You could make a purchase, share an episode, maybe join the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. It's a place to go for that. You're going to get access to exclusive content, stuff we don't put anywhere else for as little as two bucks. You want to know who's coming up as guests? We put that information there. Want some bonus audio episodes? Five bucks a month. Want exclusive videos? maybe some training materials, $10. At $25, we give you all of our books for free. At $50, you can get in on the School Owner's Mastermind. There's so much value coming back out of that. Check it out, patreon.com slash whistlekick. If you want the whole list, all the things that you could do to help us in our effort to grow, support, put martial arts in every home, whistlekick.com slash family. I had a lot of fun talking to Scott. Super nice guy started martial arts for, in kind of his words, maybe not the most noble of reasons, but it didn't take too long before it had the impact that so many of us know martial arts can have. And it, I'm going to say, changed his life. And what we talk about today is that transition, how martial arts has shifted in the landscape, how he sees it moving, his time working with some incredible martial artists, including himself, the books he's worked on. It's a, a varied conversation, goes all over the place in the best possible way. So I hope you stick around, listen, let me know what you think on the other side, and I'll see you at the outro. Hey, Scott, how are you? I'm good. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Okay, can you hear great. Me? We good? Can hear you. Awesome. How are you? Thanks for doing I'm this. good. How are you? I'm well. It's been a good day. We recorded four Thursday episodes. Thursday episodes are not interview. They're, they're topic driven. So we did four of those this morning. I got you and then one other guest and then I get to relax. Oh, wow. <laughs> a long day. Already. Yeah. Well, uh, if you're good with it, let's just jump in. Great. Yeah. yeah let's, just, let's just get started. I, I like when we just get to jump in like that. It stays a little more organic. I like to start with why. Either why or, or when. So let's start with why. Why did you start training? Why did I start training? That's a good question, man. Um, you know, I think the easy answer is that, like, like a lot of people, you know, I sort of felt I was like, uh, I mean, I was I was a little bit older than than something. I was seventeen when I started training. Uh, is that? Can you hear that? Is that going to mess you up? The, the fan going? I don't hear a fan though. Okay, good. All right. So yeah, I was older. I was like 17. I was in high school. And um, I mean, I was like a lot of kids sort of like had some issues getting a little bit bullied, had some mm -hmm. issues with uh, self-esteem and things like that. And so I, um, you know, I, I, I thought I wanted to fight. I thought I wanted to, you know, feel tough and feel, feel capable, feel like I could stand up for myself. And so I, I had a friend who was training at a school in town in the town where I live. And 
he invited me to come to a class when I started and I just uh, I fell in love with it and I never quit. Nice. Um, but, uh, you know, it's something where it's like, I think about it a lot because, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, there's so many positive things that people get from the martial arts and yeah. realistically, I would be, I would be, it would be a mistake to just look at it and say, you know, oh, the, the, to look at it from a perspective of saying that it came from a negative motivation and that realistically the solution to that negative motivation was to confront the negative motivation rather than view it as a positive step in my life. But I do have moments now where I look at it and I go, man, like what, what, what does it say about somebody that they feel so threatened that they devote their whole life to preparing for this fight that is probably never going to happen. So the question of like, why did I start martial arts or why did I stay in it, man? It's like something where I like, I think about how when I started and a lot of the time when I was coming up and training, it grew out of a very adversarial perception of the relationship between myself and the world that I viewed the world as a very antagonistic place. Mm -hmm. And that in light of this antagonistic relationship I had with the world, I had to be tough and I had to be strong and I had to be capable and I had to be ready to fight. And the reality was those were energies that I was tapping into in my environment, but they weren't really the, the whole story of my, of my environment. Yeah. Um, and if, if I hadn't been able to sort of self-medicate that anxiety, I might have had to try to connect to a different energy. And that might have been, <laughs> it might have been a, a, a better use with my, for my life than, you know, getting my face punched for 20 years. But, but uh, you going in for that reason, right? This is, to me, this is one of the beauties of martial arts is you went in for a reason that you're, you're kind of holding up now in hindsight and saying, maybe that wasn't the best motivation, but it's been, through that time and through that training that not only have you had that insight, but it still gave you what you needed, even if you wish you had gone there with a different impetus. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very, right. It's easy to say this now knowing it's like, uh, I wish I was, you know, I wish I knew now what I didn't know when I was 20. Right. It's like, yeah, but that level of understanding goes with being 20 and the right. level of understanding now. Exactly. You don't get to have a 40 year old wisdom in a 20 year old body. It's, right. It's, but what, like the uh, wisdom comes from experience, experience comes from a lack of wisdom kind of thing. Something know? like that. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, show me, show me a 17 year old who's got it figured out. Right. <laughs> like it, it's Certainly. not, I, I remember being 17. I thought I knew everything. Right. Like, and I think most of us think we've got a pretty good handle on life and we don't. And the older we get, the more we realize we don't. I, I want to go back to that. You describe it as an antagonistic view of the world. Was that solely from bullying? Because mo most of us, you know, Obviously, bullying has shades of gray, right? Like there, there's there's name calling and then there's literally getting pounded, you know, multiple times per week. Most of us are somewhere in the middle. Right. But even folks who have uh, a solid experience with bullying, there are other things in life that can help them kind of diffuse the impact that that has on their lives. So being that, as you're describing it now, your worldview was around bullying and defending yourself, being protected, wanting, I'm, I'm using these words now, wanting a methodology to stand up against that and feel safe. Was there other stuff going on? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, but it's all like unremarkable. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, not getting along with my dad kind of stuff. You sure. Know? It's not, it wasn't like, uh, you know, I wasn't not thrown out of the house at nine. Oh, no, none of that stuff. Wasn't abused. Wasn't, um, 
any of any of that stuff. Okay. So what's the earliest you remember your reason for training being something else? Mm, you mean you went in for that one reason, right? To to feel safe. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's not the reason you train now. No, no. So that changed at some point. Do you know when that changed? Um, uh, so I remember, let's see, probably 10 years ago. So this wow. is 13 years into martial arts. No, it's probably it's a little bit earlier than that. Okay. Let's call it let's call it ten years then. And I was teaching um, jujitsu, and um, I was in the process of of trying to. Um, I was a brown belt in jujitsu, and I was in the process of of, of that final stage of. Mm -hmm. What's it going to take to get my black belt? What is the what are the refinements I need to to work on myself to to get to that place? And it was in that process that I started to really see that the things that were keeping me from um, advancing were all, um, you know sort of like the, um, the, the, the sand in the gears of my personality or my mentality or my, um, or my, my process, my ego, my, these things. So as I started to, to approach training as a, as a methodology for becoming aware of, you know, what my own brain was doing, where like the moments when I, should be adapting and instead I'm insisting the moments when I'm insist uh, uh, should be insisting and instead I'm adapting the moments when I'm so locked into one uh, view of how the thing works that I can't see I can't hear the feedback that the situation is actually giving me mm. these things were all um, they started to become more and more apparent as I was looking for the sort of like you know, what, what are the, what's the drag on my progress? And, it, and it's always, you know, it's always me, like the, the, the knowledge is there and the information is there and the feedback is all there, right? You're training, the thing works or it doesn't work. And the reason it worked or didn't work, it's there. It'll, it'll right, right. tell you why it didn't work. It'll tell you, you were late and you were late because your, your head was late or your you were distracted or you were afraid or any of these things that your brain does. Sure. It's all there if you can look at it, but if you can't look at it, you can't pick up that information. And so when I started to, to realize that this is just, this process is just a, a mirror and whether you can look in the mirror or not is that's on you. And it's, mm. um, and it's going to determine whether or not you, it's going to determine the rate of your progress and the effectiveness of your, of your progress. Um, and I, and to, in seeing that in training, it's very quickly becomes apparent that this is, um, you know, the, 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 the hangups you have in training or the hangups you have in life. If you get over, people have said these things before, but if you get, you know, easily frustrated and that frustration makes you use too much force um, and the situation may be in a situation where you're getting frustrated, maybe the answer is to, to, to become creative and think about a new solution instead of doubling down out of anger. So maybe if you do that in training, you realize, man, that's how I deal with interpersonal problems. That's how I deal with my relationships. That's how I deal with situations with my, with my family. That's how I do it. Right. So how you, how effective you are in your, in your life is, you know, it's just like how effective you are on the mat. It's how full, skillfully do you engage with the situation that you're in how skillfully do you apply your energy to your situation that you're in? Um, and usually the determining factor in, in, in that question is, you know, how clearly do you see what's going on and how easily can you be whatever the situation needs to be or, or, or do the thing the situation needs for you to do and not let your emotions determine 
oh, I, I'm so angry. I just want to, I want to yell at this guy, even though it's not productive to yell at this guy. So, you know, let's call this 12 years ago, 13 years ago, started to recognize that this was a, a very powerful tool um, and to become more intentional about using it um, as a, as a tool for trying to uh, engage more effectively in my own life and, and, and avoid, you know, negative situations, avoid, uh, unproductive situations, mm -hmm. um, and just try to try to be more, um, present, more engaged, more, um, I don't know, skillful in living. Not like hitting that. everything with a hammer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it was probably like it started to become about that rather than just saying like, I mean, especially too, because like, as a, you know, you're a brown belt in jujitsu, like any street fight you get into, you know, like you've beat up enough white belts at this point where you kind of go like, okay, most people, you know, if I, like if I ever get into a fight, like for one thing, why am I going to get into a fight? But for another thing, if I get, get into a fight, Man, I roll with a lot of white belts. White belts are like an untrained guy in a fight. You know, it's like, okay, I know how to control this guy. I know how to deal with these situations. I know how to deal with, with this aggression. Um, so I've, I've got that in the bag. What else is this giving me? Because if it's just about, am I, can I protect myself in a fight? It's like blue, purple belt. You probably have that box checked. You know, it's got to be about something more. So, yeah, probably at that point. And is this something you realized in the moment as it was happening or only in hindsight? No, it sounds like that. you've thought about it a lot since. I thought about it a lot since, but I thought a lot about it at the time. I mean, okay. it was like, it was very, and I was like, um, I was like, I was turning 30. And so I was sort of like, right, just turned 30. And it, it, it was kind of like, you know, at the time, it, now it seems like kind of whatever, but at the time it was like, oh, fuck, 30. 30 felt like a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like, I don't want to, um, you know, it's like, what am I doing with my life? Am I doing the right thing with my life? How valuable is what I've, what I've done? Is this what I should keep doing? And so thinking about like, yeah, is that, you know, other people, um, you know, have spent the last 10 years doing what they did. I spent the last 10 years doing what I did at the end of it. I have I have, do I value the things that I got? What did I get from it? And do I value the things that I got from it? So yeah, I was very much thinking about that at the time. You mentioned teaching. I know you teach now. I find that most people either have very early ambitions for teaching or it's something they are thrown into and they were oftentimes resistant to it. Which were you? Um, I, I had no ambitions to become a teacher. Um, but if you're not going to be a professional fighter, um, and you want to make this what you do with your life, um, if this is the, the thing that, um, inspires you, you know, that, that, that you, that you're nourished by this practice. Um, and you want to devote the majority of your energy to it. Obviously teaching is, is the one of the main ways to do that. Um, sure. that being said, I mean, I did really, there, there are parts of teaching that I grew to really, um, find very, um, confining and very frustrating. And there are parts of teaching that I found very inspiring and very, um, you know, like if I like, if I have a class, like something like this, where I'm talking to you and we can start to, you know, pull a thread and unravel a sweater and go down a rabbit hole and we're sort of exploring different ideas. And it's like being a little kid sort of like wandering out into the woods and not sure what you're going to find. Mm -hmm. I find that very energizing and very rewarding. And a lot of times, um, I mean, I was like, I was training this morning with my one uh, training partner and uh, I was telling him, I was like, you know, that thing I said to you like last Thursday, it's like, that was really good. Like I got a lot out of hearing. Like, I don't, 
sometimes I hear things the same time that I say them. And uh, it's like, this, this is a really good idea. It's an interesting idea. There's a lot there. And so mm-hmm. it's like, sometimes when I'm, you know, just teaching, like, I don't know where we're going either. And I discover things um, sure. as, as I'm, as I'm saying them. So that process I find incredibly rewarding, but the, the process of teaching, um, you know, teaching white belts eventually became pretty uh, frustrating. <laughs> It it, it sounds because many of us have had this experience teaching the same thing over and over again to the same people and feeling like these are my own words. Tell me if you agree. Feeling like I'm stuck on the surface, not Mm. getting to go deeper, not getting to explore the depth that I know is there. I've, I've been there, I've seen it, I've trained in it, I've even taught it to some people. And so now having to come back up. And spend the time here feels, it can feel hollow Mm -hmm. at times. Is that what you're talking about? Um, That's partially, I mean, that's certainly part of it. Um, I think there's a, uh, for me, there was a broader issue that had to do with feeling like um, I, I feel like the uh, well, this is a much bigger subject, but the sort of the anti anti intellectual uh, trend in American culture, mm. uh, where <laughs> yes, is, that is a bigger subject. Oh, yeah. Ooh, let me sit up straight. <laughs> well, the, you know, I got very tired of, uh, look, I think one of the things, and I think I said this at some point to somebody else, but like one of the things that makes jujitsu very strong, any martial art that is tested under fairly limited rules becomes very strong. Mm-hmm. But they also trend to look like each other, right? Mm-hmm. So the the within the parameters, um, it, it, with a broad enough set of parameters, a martial art can be can be very effective. So things like Muay Thai, boxing, wrestling, judo, and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, the more limited the rule set, the more limited the parameters of the training, the more the martial art is equipped to handle because it's what it's exposed to mm-hmm. okay so this constant stress testing and the constant need to to back up what you're saying and what you're teaching has made the martial art very strong and when the gracies showed up in the u.s they said anybody can challenge us um and we'll prove to you that our that our martial art works um when I encounter people now who, so there's a fine line in martial arts around the idea of respect, right? Which is that if I demand that you never challenge me and that you respect me, I create an environment in which my teaching, my technique never gets stress tested. And eventually I drift away from legitimacy. Um, If I put myself in a situation where any idiot with $20 can walk in the door and I'm second degree black belt, I've been teaching for this number of years. I've been training for this number of years. I've traveled, I've competed, I've done all these things. And you feel like you get to come and challenge me just because you got 20 bucks and a pulse. I'm a little bit not respecting myself mm. if I if I engage with you. So the feeling that I was perpetually pr- having to that the that the onus was on me to prove to these people that what I was doing was or what I was teaching them was legitimate became really irksome eventually in that, look, 
I'm not telling you to do anything for my own benefit. Like if I'm, if I'm teaching you something, it's for your benefit. Right. So if you challenge me, I, how, how much investment do you think I have in you getting better? So the, the, the project of feeling like I had to spend a lot of time chipping through people's defenses to give them something that made them better and got me nothing. I was like, what am I even doing? So the, the, the inversion where the teacher now has to prove to the student that they have something worth teaching. It's like, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we should have blind obedience. I'm not saying we should have blind loyalty, but if we come to an environment as a student, respect the teacher, the teacher respects you. That's a perfect relationship, right? If I come to you as a teacher with the, giving you the benefit of the doubt that you know what you're talking about and you're going to have to prove to me that you don't, mm-hmm. not that you do, I think that's a little bit more the right place to start. And it feels like people nowadays start from the attitude of like, well, you got to prove to me that you know what you're talking about. And the f- problem is the majority of people, they don't know anything about anything. Right. right. <laughs> it's like you come into me, you don't know anything about look, I, I don't care. Like, I'm not saying you have to know anything about fighting. It's 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 absolutely like you know a lot about computer programming, you know a lot about race car driving. It's awesome. I'm not saying you have to know about what I know about, but if you walk into a room where I'm teaching, of course you know less about the subject that I study than I do. It's not a knock on you. You studied one thing, I studied this, and now I know this. So why do you think your opinion about what you know nothing about is so valuable? Right? Like and the call in radio uh, uh, fallacy, right? We get an expert on the uh-huh. t- on the show, and then we let whoever call in and tell their opinion about the Monday thing. morning quarterbacks, you know, whatever, right. whatever you want to call it. And, you know, I find, so I, I, there, there are some folks who look at, at BJJ specifically, and they, they carve out a separate corner in martial arts. I don't, I don't do that. To me, it is a traditional martial art. I've trained a little bit of BJJ. I have utmost respect. We've had plenty of BJJ practitioners on. There is a cultural subset in the way it is often trained, discussed, treated. And you're, you're getting to some of the heart of it. And to my mind, a large chunk of that comes from the public exposure to those who do not train, right? Very few people see karate or Taekwondo before they step foot in a place where they train. Mm. But if Mm. you want to watch BJJ, you got plenty of examples. And some of those examples are in media at a pretty broad exposure and are, whether or not they are, are purported to be very high skilled very good people. And the commentary around it is presented as expert level. Mm -hmm. So you get Mm -hmm. people who observe things and hear feedback on those things that are being done and they armchair quarterback it. And they're like, well, you know, I watched this fight and this thing happened and they should have done this. And they do that long enough. They start to think that they actually know. Yeah. Is that what you think it is or is it elsewhere? No, that's I mean, that's a very good point is that, you know, in in a lot of ways, it is a it is a it comes with the territory and it's a it's a product of the success of of, of the art and the the ascension of the art. Really? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, no, it's a good point. It's a good point. If it if it is all but guaranteed, given that exposure, would you change it? Hmm. This is something that you love, something that you're identifying elements that you dislike. But I would assume because you love this art that you train, Mm -hmm. you are proud of its exposure and its rise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it a necessary evil? Could we adjust it? I threw like six questions at you. (laughs) You can answer any of them. Um. I don't, I don't know. I, so I, um, are you, do you know who Robert Drysdale is? I don't. He's a, he's a high level, uh, jujitsu com- competitor and, okay. and teacher and MMA fighter, uh, re- retired now, but he, he wrote a book about, um, he wanted to create a documentary about the, um, 
the untold story of jiu-jitsu in Brazil, because mm-hmm. at the time that jiu-jitsu or judo arrived in Brazil, there were many, many judo practitioners who arrived in Brazil in that influx of Japanese immigrants. Mm-hmm. And many of them started uh, schools and taught. And so you have a um, in the early part of the 20th century, what you really had was this um, melting pot of, of jiu-jitsu and judo schools, styles, competitors, who, and it was in the the context of that that the Gracie family uh, cre- developed their their take on the art. Sure. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the point is, I I edited, I worked with him on on putting this. He he wrote a book about the process of creating this documentary, and I edited and, and helped oh, him cool. publish this book. Um, and there was a lot of conversation in that book and in our sort of editing process about the 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 space that opened up between Kodokan Judo, which was where all these 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 people were they were not jujitsu practitioners, they were judoka. They were they studied under Kano or they studied under the the instructors at the Kodokan. And I don't know if you you have studied judo, but judo is a very traditional, mm-hmm. I mean and I'm a very traditional martial art. Um, and judo was um, developed specifically. I don't know how much you know about the, the history of judo, but, but, a little but, Jiro, bit. but some of our but, listeners may not know anything. So, okay. so Jiro Kano is an, a, a really, a really brilliant person. And he was living at a time when Japan was opening up to the, to the West and Japan was starting to modernize. And there was a, uh, 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 a real debate going on, a, an un, unresolved debate about, um, you know, w- what do we take from the West? What do we keep that is traditional? Um, is is the future Western? Is there a place for for traditional Japan in 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 the future? If if the future is a globalized Western culture, basically, and Jigoro Kano said look, the, the martial arts embody some of what is best in, in Japanese culture. Um, and there is a place for them in the Western culture because Western culture already has this idea of physical education and physical culture, the idea of gymnastics for physical development and uh, athletic endeavor as a way of developing the, the person, the individual and expressing what's what's best in us, our human potential. And he said, our martial arts can be that. And so he basically codified a system that was incredibly innovative at the time. So, he, and he developed the idea of martial arts, not as uh, killing arts, but as a, as a way to develop individuals in, the, in very much the way the West was talking about physical culture and athletic mm-hmm. endeavor. So it was almost like the Grecian Olympic ideal, but in with with uh, Japanese martial arts. But within that, there's this idea that the point there are there. If you look at the the traditional breakdown of judo, there were three goals. Um, one of them was self defense. One of them was physical development, and then one of them was creating good citizens, developing virtue the characteristic of a good citizen, honesty, dedication, discipline, loyalty, all these things that we think of as the higher virtues. And that a lot of times we now still think of as things that martial arts develop. And so judo always had as part of it, this idea that we are trying to develop um, people. We're trying to, to bring out the best in people. Um, And it wasn't just about fighting, right? Self-defense and physical combat were one of the three priorities, but equal to that was this idea that we developed the individual. And one of the things that Drysdale talks about in the book and that we talked about a lot in the process of editing the book is that there, that this is one of the things that seems to have been a bit lost when judo made the trip across the ocean to Brazil. Mm-hmm. And in Brazil, with the, the the way it integrated with Brazilian culture and some of the aspects there, it became very much about fighting. 
And it lost some of those other aspects. And one of the things we we talked about and he talks about in the book is sort of the modern, uh, a lot of what is coming to dominate modern jujitsu is self-promotion, trash talking, self-aggrandizement, very um, uh, aspects that you would you would easily categorize under these sort of toxic masculinity things. Mm -hmm. This is, man, I don't know if this is really for the best. Is this, is this really adding something positive to the world in the way that this art has the potential to, to add to the world? Um, and, you know, and so uh, the interesting thing is I was working on that book concurrent with working on uh, another, another book, a, a memoir by the first student of Horry and Gracie hmm. in, in the U.S. And um, one of the things we talked about a lot in that book is how Horry and Elio Gracie were very focused on, you know, the jujitsu is for people who feel weak, intimidated. They feel like they can't, um, they're, they're afraid. And this is something to empower them and develop them and make them feel uh, capable and confident. And that it's really, the art is for those people. And then when it just becomes for people who are already aggressive and competitive and have those strengths and feel like they can just go out and kick ass whether they know anything or not, it loses the, the gift it can give to the world. And so we talked a lot about like, where's jujitsu going? And who is it for? And how does it serve those people? Um, so that's a very long answer to the question, what, you know, what would I change? Or, you know, yeah. where do I think, um, do I think this just goes one with the other? Um, I mean, I think in the modern landscape of the way we consume media and the way we engage with drama and feuds and all the things that make reality TV and professional wrestling successful. We're not, you're not going to change the fact that, 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 um, you know, gets pay-per-view buys. I mean, one of the things we're dealing with, like, so I'm in Cleveland, mm -hmm. Steve Miocic, greatest heavyweight champion in the UFC can't get a fight. Why? Because he's nice. He doesn't talk trash. He respects all his promotions. Or, uh, opponents and it doesn't get people to want to buy it doesn't papers. sell it right. doesn't make dollars so if you're a jujitsu yeah. fighter am i going to tell you hey man it's better to be a good person don't talk trash about your opponents no because how are you going to have a career right. it's the nature of the way the thing is now but i think we have to understand that for what it is and have a culture within within schools and school owners where we realize like this is about what we can give and, and who we can give it to and, and what it can do for people, you know, whether they're going to be a successful competitor or not. Of course, the, you know, it's sort of like a hundred people who are timid, you know, versus one aggressive fighter who, you know, it's like wins a lot of fights and brings money to your academy that way. Or, you, mm -hmm. you know, it's like you can be as successful you serve more people who are like not going to be high profile. And maybe that's, that's the mentality um, that like, you know, like there's the, there's another lineage in, in, in Brazil, uh, the Fada lineage where, whereas the Gracies were always this, this kind of accused of only serving the upper tier and like being almost like a country club. The Fadas went in to the, to the, to the lower uh, socioeconomic areas and they opened schools and they taught all the children for basically for free. And they just spread jujitsu to people because they felt like people could benefit from it. Mm. So if you have an understanding of the sort of these, these cultural trends and making a decision about which part of it you want to be a part of. And so, man, it's really cool that, that Gordon Ryan's winning all this stuff and he's 24 years old, made a million dollars from selling instructional. That's amazing. Good for him. Uh, but you know, I don't, the, the, the trash talk and the, you know, all this stuff is maybe not what we're, what we're about at our school, but like, you know, yeah. it's like jujitsu is big enough 
for everybody for, for, for that stuff and for the other stuff. And so it's like, I, I don't know that it needs to change, but I do think people need to know that you don't have to be that, you know, that that's, that that's not all it is, you know? What, what you're, you're reminding me of is this, this broad societal pressure towards the easy success, however you define success, right? And if you look at social media, that's a perfect corollary because what, what are the easiest ways to get likes and comments and follows on any social media platform? It's either through violence, um, sexualization, right? Mm -hmm. the, the elements of humanity and society that I think most of us would agree are maybe not the, the, the best things, at least not the things that are most aspirational. When we think mm -hmm. about what we want our family, our children, our friends to aspire to, it's generally not those things, right? And, and, if, and if you enjoy doing them, if that's part of your life, you know, whatever, that's fine. But I think quite often you, you brought up the example of money. If someone wants to make a living as a BJJ something, if, they, mm -hmm. if, it, if it is the thing that has perhaps saved their life as they see it, it's the thing they want to invest all of who they are into, and maybe they don't want to teach and so they go and they start taking fights and they recognize, okay, so I can remain here in this pool of fighters who get the worst options, or mm -hmm. I can caricature myself and maybe lean into that. I don't agree mm -hmm. with it. I don't believe in it, but it makes me more money. And how many repetitions of that until you start to believe your own hype and you become the character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we see that. And anybody who, who, you know, I don't watch UFC pay-per-views often. I, I used to, but I'm still aware of what's going on. I still pay attention to some of the names just because of what I do. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that. We've seen that with a number of people as they've come up. And I'm not going to name names, but as they've come up, what we used to point out and say, I think they're just doing this to you know, for promotional reasons. And then you look at it and you're like, no, I think that's actually who you are now. And it's sad. Mm -hmm. So. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm, it's all good. I'm having a little bit technical difficulty over here. Okay. No worries. Do, I'll, I'll do what do you got to do. We'll edit okay. if need be. <laughs> <laughs> so let's switch gears. You mentioned books and that you've gotten involved yeah. in books, and it's really clear from the way you're talking about books, again, that you, you, you are thoughtful about your art, that you appreciate the history that, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you've, as you said, pulled a lot of threads over the years, mm -hmm. and you, you've gone down rabbit holes probably further than most people. How did you get into books? Why books? Why why? take something that is so physical and maybe thoughtful, but really implements physically and invest time into something that is as non-physical as you can get writing, reading, researching books, right? seems kind of the opposite. Uh, uh, yeah. I guess it's um, so I, um, I mean, I, I, so I, I would see how did I, this, <laughs> how did I get into books? Um, I was a big, big reader as, as a kid, uh, you know, comic books into mm -hmm. fantasy novels, into, into the sort of the classics of Western literature. And I went um, and I actually um, studied English and writing in college. Um, and so I have a degree in um, my, my college was actually one of the few that offers a, a major in creative writing as a subset of the English major. And so I've degree in English with an emphasis on creative writing. And my, my real aspiration coming up was, as a, as a young, younger person was to be a writer, was to be a novelist. And so that, that, that was, that was really my, my focus. And so these two endeavors, um, martial arts and, and writing sort of were concurrent uh, undertakings for me. Um, and, and yeah, no, it's, it, you're making, you make an interesting point <laughs> that they are somewhat contradictory, I guess. But, um, 
you know, I, I always sort of viewed them as, um, you know, martial arts is about um, skillfully creating effect, right? Skillfully expressing an idea physically. Um, and so there was, and it's uh, largely about efficiency. Um, it's about uh, building uh, progress uh, in a in a in a confrontation. It's about negotiating um, different parts of the situation you're in, um, recognizing opportunities. I mean, knowing how to articulate an idea or to handle uh, an argument how to build an argument, how when, when you need to, um, when you need to acknowledge the other side, how you work to just, these are very related to, um, I mean, I think they're very related to jujitsu. Um, you know, one is just done, done uh, in, in the written form. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to me, there's a lot of synergy That's there. A little bit pretentious. <laughs> no, no, it's 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 not. No, there's a lot of synergy there. The idea, you know, you're going to find few people, if any, who spend more time thinking about martial arts than mm -hmm. I do. Right? Like it's it's kind of my job. I think about martial mm -hmm. arts. I've written books myself. We do two episodes of this show each week. Right? Like I'm I'm constantly thinking, discussing martial arts, and and I see a tremendous amount of value in that. Because when you do get on the mat, right, you you have a deeper understanding of why you're doing it. And the, 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 if you look at military history, the thing generals had to do was convince their soldiers of why. Why were they doing it? When you have a solid why, you invest more into it, right? However that manifests in particular for you, for I, for listeners, right? And when you reach a certain level of training, I think there is a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can take a particular role session with somebody and unpack, okay, you know, that, that movement didn't go the way I expected. What was, you know, I went for this and it didn't happen. I can say the same thing about, you know, I, I, I don't do nearly as much grappling as you do. I'm more of a stand-up guy. So I can, I can think about that. I can think about that in, I taught over the weekend, I taught a seminar. There were elements to the seminar that I taught that I'm like, okay, so I could have done this piece a little bit differently. I could have done this here differently. There's a lot to think about. I don't mm -hmm. see them as, as opposite. I kind of set you up in that way because I wanted to see how you responded. Um, there, there's, there's a martial arts principle, right? Like give you something a little bit off, see how you take it. But yeah, it's, it's all good. Yeah. 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 Well, and it, like, and, and, and I guess the, the other side of it too, which you just brought up, which is that as a, as a teacher, um, how, how I, engage with what I understand your understanding to be and how I speak to you in a way that speaks particularly to you and maybe the way you're thinking about something or the way I can maybe tell you're sort of, you've got a concept in your head that's almost right, but it's not quite right. And mm -hmm. how I would build, build a, a lesson for you where I meet you where you are, maybe take you a step further so you're comfortable and then build those steps toward a final conclusion. Right. You know, that this is all the structuring of thought, the structuring of, of knowledge and, and how you, how you communicate that. I mean, you can communicate poorly. You can communicate effectively. You can communicate inefficiently. You can communicate efficiently. So it's another skill of, of my energy going to you and what it accomplishes when it gets there. Yeah. I'm curious of your how you respond to this. So we've had people on on the show over the years who have related martial arts to language. That mm. a particular technique might be a word, and mm -hmm. you know, in the context of, of of a lot of arts that have structured forms, you know, a kata, a tool, that maybe that's like a poem or a short story. Oh, interesting. As a someone with a creative writing background and clearly some, some interest in writing. Do you see what you do when you're on the mat, when you're rolling or teaching, do you see overlap there with creative writing? Well, one of the things that I have 
have said to people, and I think it pertains to, to, I mean, I have a, I have a black belt in a style called Kuxel Do, which is mm-hmm. similar to Kuxel Wan that you may have heard of. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's very traditional in the sense that it's, um, you, you learn katas, <clears throat> you learn uh, techniques done, you know, basically one, two, three, four, five, do those. Sure, sure. And then, um, you know, so it was mostly kata techniques and sparring. That's, you know, mostly point style sparring. Um, and so I, um, I've thought about it in terms of not necessarily, um, native writing, but in terms of learning a foreign language, Mm, right? That there's, um, so in jujitsu, the the sort of the bedrock text for for Gracie Jiu Jitsu is what we call the the master text, which is Elio Gracie and Horian Gracie put together a beautiful book where they outline the whole core curriculum mm-hmm. of of Gracie Jiu Jitsu, which is the what basically the white to blue belt curriculum. So all the standing self defense, all the ground self defense is the basic. You know, if you're gonna fight an untrained opponent. Um, what's he most likely to do? So he's going to try to punch you. He's trying to headlock you. He's going to try to strangle you. He's going to try to kick you. If you get on the ground, he's going to put you in head. all those basic attacks and the self-defense for those basic attacks. And um, this includes some things like what if he hits you with a club? What if he's got a gun? What if he's got a knife? Um, but it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a huge book. Um, and it, but it lays out these, these core techniques, uh, maybe 150 techniques. And people sometimes criticize, um, you know, because there's a there's a contingent that likes to criticize the Gracies, and they say this stuff is totally unrealistic. You say, well, I think maybe you're thinking about it wrong. You say, if you were going to learn French, I don't speak French, right? But if I was going to learn French, the first thing I'd probably do is buy a phrase book, and I would learn those phrases so that I knew how to say some basic things. Um, And I would learn those phrases just by rote. I would know Mm -hmm. how to repeat them. And I could go over to France and I could more or less negotiate. You know, I'd get a lot of help from the people who were responding to me that recognized I didn't know anything. But I could ask where the restaurant was. I could order a meal. I could pay for a hotel. You could function. You could function. So I'd learn those phrases. But anybody who, who, you know, if, if somebody came up to you and said, oh, you want to learn French? You got a phrase book? Oh, that phrase book's totally unrealistic. It's not unrealistic. It's just the first step to gaining fluency. So after you get comfortable with the phrases, you can start to recognize, oh, man, I could take this word from this phrase and put it with this setup. And now I have a new idea. And as you gain fluency, you start being able to express what you're trying to say easily where your thoughts become words and you don't have to translate them through the limits of, I know this technique or I know this phrase. And so people is, Oh man, this this techniques are unrealistic. They're not unrealistic. They're just not fluency. They're the phrase book that start you toward fluency. Nobody says this is all you'll ever need. Nobody hands you a phrase book and says, this is, you, you know, French now, of course you don't know French now. Okay. But uh, it's, it's, it's where you start, much like, you know, I, I've said this, um, I, I had an idea at one point. So the guy who um, I started learning Kuksul with is, you know, he was my main training partner in jujitsu, and, you know, we're still close friends and training partners. But at one time, he was thinking about transforming because he, he was he's still running a Kuksul Do program. It's very successful and popular in, in our town. and. Um, but one time we were thinking about what, what if we evolved it? Because now we recognize the importance of grappling. We recognize the importance of throwing and you want to teach all these things. And those aren't really part of Kuksul. So we said, okay, what do we, if we were going to design a curriculum for this new martial art that was integrating these aspects, what would that curriculum look like? We said, well, you have to think about it in terms of who's your student. 
right? The student is, I've never done anything before. I don't know how to throw a kick or a punch. So the beginning is you stand in front of a mirror in one stance and you throw your different hand strikes Mm -hmm. and you stand in one stance and you throw your kicks. Okay. So now you have single word vocabulary. Okay. Now I teach you some combinations and now you have a sentence maybe. Mm -hmm. And now I teach you a kata and you have an idea of how to chain multiple combinations together. And again, we're learning a new language and we're developing toward fluency where after I have It's in my body of what are my techniques? Mm -hmm. What are my combinations? What are my multiple combinations that evolve and and change over the course of a prolonged confrontation? Mm -hmm. Then I graduate to, no, I just freeform. Now I know the things. I'm I'm, I'm fluent, right? So, you know, I I think there's an idea there of, of it's even if, you know, even if we're not talking about learning a foreign language, we're talking about gaining a fluency through a progressive curriculum. I, I'm, skills on top of skills. I'm right there with you. If you look at the way children, young children learn anything, they need examples. We don't sit them down with a textbook. We don't explain to them grammatical rules. You know, we'll correct them. No, mm-hmm. you don't say this phrase. You say this phrase. So they walk mm-hmm. around with, phrases it's an internalized phrase book and they start mm-hmm. to put anybody who has kids knows they start to put phrases break out those words and put them together and sometimes it doesn't work and we correct them with that and over time you start to understand just from a lot of examples how this stuff works mm-hmm. and it's not just for foreign language it's for anything else and and this is where i think when a lot of people get down on structured forms mm-hmm. anything that's not free form movement within martial arts, I think they're missing the point that there is a lot of value in giving you some combinations that make sense. I'm not going to, I'm probably never going to step out, throw a low block and a reverse punch exactly as it is done in, to my knowledge, every style has a form that has that in there somewhere. I'm probably never going to do it quite like that. But there is some value in my understanding of how those techniques connect, how my hips move, moving from one to the next, right? Like there's just because the value isn't complete, it's not 100% accurate to reality, as you're talking about with this book that the Gracie's put together, just because it's not 100% accurate doesn't mean it's 0% relevant. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's part of developing a a physical fluency that that is going to serve you. Yes. Now, the the Cooksul dough, why did you step into that? Because if, if I'm getting the timeline right, you'd been training jujitsu and judo for a bit before you. No, even... that was so. That was my first martial art. That was what I started with. So when I was 17, I started with Kuk Sul Dao. Oh, okay. I backwards. So, I, I missed that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was the school that was. So this is two, uh, 1999, um, and obviously, even though. Um, UFC has happened and is happening. Uh, it, it wasn't, I feel like what I, I mean, what I remember of the culture around the UFC at the time was we very much had an attitude in the traditional martial arts that that was brawly. That was, that wasn't what we did, you know? Well, in the first few, it definitely was brawling. Yeah, it was absolutely. rough. <laughs> so, so we, we were, we, and, and like I said, this was, I was, you know, was looking for something. Um, my friend was doing this martial art and he invited me to come to a class and I, and I loved it. And I, I was basically there every day from then on. Nice. Um, and then when I, I went away to college, would come back in the summers and train. And then I would, um, and then after college, I came back and, um, it was right around the time that the ultimate fighter happened mm-hmm. and you started to see uh, the, it, it was part of the rebranding of mixed martial arts as these guys are athletes. These guys are martial artists. This is a legitimate thing. This is not a barroom brawl. And we, as people who had always, you know, we were doing a traditional martial art, but we, we, we felt like, and we wanted to believe we were, capable fighters and so when you have this thing that comes out and says no this is what you got to do to fight so man we better be doing that 
And so my my training, my my uh, instructor there at this time, there uh, a Hoyler Gracie affiliate had mm -hmm. opened in Cleveland. And so he started training with them. He started bringing it back. I started going up there with them. And that was how our, our jujitsu uh, jiu journey mm -hmm. started. And then I eventually fell in love with, with jujitsu, yeah. stopped doing kuksu altogether. And uh, and then it, it was after, actually it was after I got my black belt in jujitsu that I started training in judo specifically. So kuksu, jujitsu, and then jujitsu and judo. Why judo? There was, there was an MMA part in there. Yeah. Why judo? Why judo? Um, yeah. So I reached a point with um, with jujitsu where I felt like um, I, I had plenty to learn, right? Mm -hmm. But as a um, as a black belt in jujitsu, I had spent so much time on the on the ground that I didn't really um when it, i wasn't seeing stuff that i didn't know how to i didn't know what was going on mm -hmm. right i everything that was happening i knew what was going on even if it was bad i knew what was going on so i had a certain sense of familiarity yeah. with every nuance of every position that i was encountering yep. it's like plenty to work on plenty to learn but i was all familiar territory more or less on the feet i felt like I could get throws, but most of it was like, I didn't know what was happening a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. It's like, if I got somewhere where I could get a throw, it was great, but the rest of it was kind of a blur. And I didn't have that feeling of like, oh, now he put the pressure there, then it put the step, then I did this, then I did that. And it was just like, I knew, okay. I, and, I, and I said, man, I really want that same feeling of like, this is all familiar territory with, with the, the stand-up. And... Um, I actually wrote a, a blog post about this at one point um, was I had this blog I was writing at the time. And it was like, basically, you know, there's a, um, you know, there's this debate where it's like, okay, is, is jujitsu enough to win a fight? Mm -hmm. Is, is jujitsu a complete martial art or does it need to be supplemented? Like, cause we started with saying, okay, you need jujitsu on the ground and you need Muay Thai on the feet. And then you start learning Gracie Jiu Jitsu and you realize, man, this is really designed for dealing with punches, dealing with clinches, dealing with, it's not just ground fighting, right? So this whole thing of like, it's just a ground martial art. It's not. So if you understand the complete martial art, you recognize that, man, it, it, and, and if you look at um, Judo, right? Judo has three components, at, at waza, uh, Nage waza, and Kansetsu waza, right? Mm -hmm. So you have striking, throwing, and grappling. So all three phases of any, I mean, and these are the phases that Bruce Lee talked about, this is the phases that everybody talks about, because these are the three phases. You you start separate, you have a striking phase, a clinching phase, and then on the ground. Mm -hmm. So what happens? Unless somebody gets knocked down on the feet. So you need a, to have a complete martial art, you need to talk about these things. And, and traditional judo does, and traditional grace jiu-jitsu does. But I felt like, but any martial art, your comfort and skill is going to develop the most around the things you spend the most time doing. Absolutely. And in Grace Jiu Jitsu, I was spending most of my time on the ground. Or in, in realistically, that's just a question of volume. Like, right? So if I'm if I'm gonna have a training, um, okay, we're gonna do a five minute round. So we 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 we're grappling for 30 seconds, we get a takedown and we're on the ground for four minutes. Right, right. Well, so the volume of time spent on the feet versus on the ground, it's just going to be disproportionate. So I said, okay, what I need is a venue in which I just focus on this 30 seconds. So when we hit the ground, we get back up. And that's judo, right? I mean, that's modern modern judo is you don't, you don't grab, you know, you, I mean, they do a little bit on the ground, but you have a very limited time and otherwise they stand you back up. So I said, okay, I want to, I want to basically have a, have a training environment where it's just focused on this we put parameters around it. We say, we're just going to focus on from the point that we clinch to the point that we're on the ground. And so it was, it was a way for me to, I mean, realistically, I thought of it as developing an aspect of what the complete martial art is, hmm. right? Whether you want to call it jujitsu or whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, Cause I, I just wanted to have that, that same feeling of, familiar exposure um yeah. 
And then I really, I really fell in love with a lot of the aspects of judo. I mean, judo is a really, um, like I said, Jigoro Kano it was an incredible, incredible person, a really brilliant person, a really forward thinking. I mean, it's, it's an incredible thing that he, to, to have that awareness and insight and vision at that time is, mm. is, is a remarkable thing, judo. We owe so much to him. Nearly everyone training today Absolutely. can trace something that happens in their school back to things that happened in the origins of judo, whether well, it's I mean, rank or, or uniforms, it's specific techniques, the codification, the, it just there's so much there. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. That, people don't realize that this entire, the entire apparatus of modern martial arts, where you would go to take a class as a form of exercise to develop yourself, and that you'd wear a rank belt, like all, he invented all these things, like this entire concept that didn't exist before. Him. And it's like, man, you don't, to, to create a new concept is, to, to create something that's never existed before you don't unless you've done it you don't realize that that's you just created a world you just and for that concept to be good right yeah plenty of people try things and they're just not good and and that's those true, con- right? they fall away yeah. or, not everything sham well right that's right <laughs> when you started stepping into judo were any of your jiu-jitsu friends training partners they push back and they're like why are you gonna waste your time on that why do that you know what's the point <laughs> uh, no i mean my 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 students were um if i if i said it was important they were like all right it's important however they did not enjoy the early part when i sucked at it and i was like kicking everybody's shins <laughs> it was like there was a, it was a painful learning curve for a lot of people okay oh so on- you were you were off training and you'd come back to your students and you guys would be doing your thing and Yep. You're working in what you're learning and uh, a little rough around the edges. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So people, people walked around with some bruised shins for a while. <laughs> like, I, I guess that. like, thank you. You know, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I got it. good because you got kicked. <laughs> it's like, so. For sure. So let's, you know, let's, let's open up the timeline. What's coming? You know, it, it sounds like you've. I want to use the word settled because that, that suggests um, a stasis. I don't mean that. You've, you've found a space that it sounds like works well for you, that you are happy and feeling satisfied because of all the various pieces that are in there. Do you see that opening up, changing, shifting mm-hmm. in the future? Are there goals that you're looking at? You're like, I want to do this. I want to do, you know, what's, what's down the line for you? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I, so I've, I've had the opportunity in the past couple of years to train with, um, Master Hicks and Gracie Mm -hmm. and, um, there is, there is so much, um, depth to his, his knowledge of jujitsu and I, I i feel like i'm in the shallowest of the shallow waters with <laughs> with that and so i for my own personal um you know martial arts journey as a student that i want to spend as much time you know with him and with the material that he's taught me and just the I, I, I have I have no sense that I'm anywhere, uh, you know, near the top of the mountain. You know, there's a lot of dark road ahead of me. Dark meaning like not illuminated. Right, not, right. Yeah. No, I, I knew I knew what you meant. <laughs> so there's a, there's so much to to see and explore, and um, that that's really where my priority is. I mean, it's I I, I feel incredibly privileged to have have had the time that i've had with him and and to have the um the the sort of the situation that i have with him now and so i I, i'm i'm here to soak up as much of that as i can um beyond that i'm you know i'm i like teaching um seminars i have relationships with a few different people around where i get to travel and um 
get to teach and meet new people and and um and train in different places i my my situation now with my my training here is very flexible mm -hmm. so i can i can travel um and uh you know sort of engage with with have different conversations with with different people like yourself you know take see what see where these conversations go it's always sure. interesting and exciting for me um and then uh i'm still uh we're in the midst of you know promoting um richard's book the 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 one memoir that i helped uh that i co-authored mm -hmm. um so that um the audiobook came out um i recorded the audiobook for that in uh oh, you read the, you read the book? i read the book yeah oh nice um so yeah this if i'm gonna start plugging stuff yeah plug, plug away um plug away yeah, this, this was an incredible book to write. This is Richard Brezzer was Horian Gracie's first student. In so the US. most people, most people are going to listen to this versus. So any, any demonstration. It's called, the book's called worth defending how Gracie Jiu Jitsu saved my life. It's available paperback, ebook, audio book. Uh, it's got like 4.9 out of five stars on Amazon with nice. 170 plus reviews. Um, people are really digging it. And it's the story of Gracie Jiu Jitsu's uh, beginnings in the U S and the first UFC, it's an incredible, incredible story. Richard, really cool. and Richard, people don't, don't necessarily know, but Richard is arguably the reason that Gracie Jiu Jitsu got its footing in the U S without Richard, oh, there arguably might not have been a Gracie Academy. I mean, Richard was Horian's go-to guy. He was his right hand man. And uh, so we're, we're working on that. Um, and then I'm also, I'm editing, um, Robert Drysdale's got another book he's working on right now. He's, he actually just sent me a draft. I'm going to read this afternoon. Um, another book about about um, jujitsu and how uh, basically it's a really interesting idea um, that, that um, basically things become more meaningful the more effort it takes to achieve them right literally the, the the size of the value of the thing is proportionate to the effort it takes so right, if you right. want to if you want a meaningful life you need a challenging life right and so approaching that uh as we as our culture seems to drift ever closer toward what you were talking about instant gratification easy success easy attention our our culture actually gets less and less meaningful and so the more we put ourselves up against big challenges, the more rewarding our lives get. Um, and he sees this as a, um, obviously he's a, he's a high, high level jujitsu competitor and a teacher. And so his experience as a coach, as a, as a fighter, um, all influences this thing. He talks about sort of the, the, the Greeks take on this and Nietzsche's take on this. It's a really interesting book. It's going to be really cool. So we've been working on that. Um, and then, yeah, man, I got I got some other writing projects I'm working on, um, but mostly just doing doing the do jujitsu and, and writing. Right on, right on. If people want to find you, website, social, email, any stuff like that, you're up to share. Yeah, so you can find me at enclavejujitsu.com. E N C L A V E jujitsu.com or scottburrauthor.com. Um, and there's a bunch of information on either or both of those about my background, my, you know, jujitsu, judo pedigree, my, uh, you know, how to, how to get in touch past and future events. Uh, you know, what I, what I teach, what I have to offer my certifications. Um, and yeah, man, I'd love to, love to hear from people. Nice. I want to reach out. I'm also on, yeah. Uh, Facebook, uh, at, Enclave Jiu Jitsu and Instagram at Enclave Jiu Jitsu and then Facebook also at Scott Burr Author. Okay. There we Please go. Out, connect. I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah. I think you sent all those over. So those will be in the show notes for folks. Awesome. And, you know, last thoughts here. You know, how do you want to go out? What, what final words do you have for the listeners today? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, I just, I appreciate the chance to, to be on this show. Um, I, you know, love to uh to be able to talk about these things and go down these rabbit holes with people and uh um i i'm always a little you know i got i have so much to to 
to learn. I'm, 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 there's so much to that I'm working on, studying, discovering. I feel like every every week I turn around and I'm like, how did I not know that? How have I been doing that like that? How have I been thinking about like this? So it's just like, um, I don't know. I, I, I hope everybody uh, has as rewarding a martial arts experience as I as I've had, and it just keeps keeps giving the way it's given to me. I, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a uh, lucky guy. You know, I've been <laughs> I've gotten a lot, so I uh, just appreciate the the time and the conversation. I had a great time with this one. Felt like I was talking to someone that could easily have been me that I would love as a training partner. And that's one of my favorite things about this show. You know, if, if I ever strike it rich in the lottery or, you know, we, we get all the things right and, and whistle kick makes a lot of money and I get a bus and I start driving around the country and training with people, I would definitely stop and train with Scott. What a good guy. And the thoughtfulness that came through, I'm sure you all picked up on it. I was talking to somebody who I think thinks as intently about the world as I do. And that's not something I find too often. So Scott, thanks for coming on. Thanks for talking to me, man. Had a blast. Hope to talk to you again soon. Listeners, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the photos that he sent in. See all the things that we got, the links for things that we talked about in the show. You know, I know you get show notes in your podcast app. But it doesn't have the photos. It doesn't have the full experience. So if you don't check out whistlekickmartialartsradio.com once in a while, I think you're missing out. If you like this show, if you like what we do, hopefully you're willing to support us in some way, even no matter how small. Here are some examples. You can sit, consider buying one of our books on Amazon. You could tell others about the show. You could support the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. If you're interested in having me come out to your school, for a seminar, we could do that too. Just hit me up. Let me know. Don't forget the code podcast15 to get 15% off anything that you will find at whistlekick.com. Got feedback? Got guest suggestions? Let's try that again, Jeremy. Guest suggestions there. Maybe a topic suggestion? I want to hear them. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media for everything we do is at whistlekick. And that takes us out to the end. So until next time, train hard smile and have a great day.